A certain deacon is visiting a remote monastery. He's coming to meet with a great and holy elder. When he arrives, however, he's saddened to hear that the elder has passed. As some solace, he asks the monks to lead him to the elder's cell to take some pictures of his place of dwelling. Upon returning, the deacon gets his photos developed. But when he comes across a certain photo, he notices something strange. The following documentary uncovers the life of Saint Iakovos of Evia, a modern day saint in the Orthodox Christian Church. His life was filled with a deep and mysterious connection to the ultimate truth of our reality. The Greco-Turkish War is in full blast. Thousands of refugees are fleeing from bloodshed and massacre. And this refugee family, made up of three children, a mother, and her mother, take their first steps off the boat and onto a new land. And while they've arrived in a comparatively safe area, it doesn't feel like home. Their father is still missing, a prisoner of war, with no word if he's alive or dead. For the next two years, the family jumps from place to place, and the mother gets by from day to day, keeping her eyes on the path and trusting God's providence. On a crisp morning, his grandmother is walking through the village. When out of the corner of her ear, she hears a familiar voice. By God's providence, his father, after being released as a prisoner, finds a job in the same exact place where, unbeknownst to him, his wife and children are living. With the family now reunited, they eventually moved to Evia, one of the larger islands in Greece where the father builds a house and the mother tends to the house. And the young Saint Iakovos now has a stable vine in which his life in Christ will grow. We had good income from my father and we could have had a wealthier lifestyle, but my mother he developed the divine virtue of almsgiving, and her hand was always open to the suffering and the poor, of which there were plenty in those years. Sometimes my father and I would return from working, and we would not even have clothes to change into, because my mother had given them away. But the grace of God was so rich, it warmed us and made us joyful. And everything was peaceful in our house. In the Greek countryside, there exists many small shrines and chapels for the saints. And throughout his childhood, he's drawn to one particular chapel dedicated to St. Pedeschevi of Rome. St. Pedeschevi of Rome is a martyr of the second century. She's arrested and tortured under the reign of Roman Emperor Anatonius Pius for her refusal to worship idols. However, the emperor releases her after she performs a miracle that cures him of his blindness. However, after some time she's arrested by a Roman governor 
for being a Christian and is eventually beheaded. It's deep in the peaceful prayer of this place that one night he sees a nun walk out from behind the iconostasis and begins cleaning the oil lamps. No matter how tired my mother was, she always washed the dishes. She would say, Heaven forbid I would die in the middle of the night, and the other women would find my dirty dishes and be scandalized. That is how I understood the situation. I thought St. Paraskevi was washing the dishes. Your fortune in life will be that much gold will pass through your hands. But it won't touch you. And this proved to be true. Large amounts of money did pass through his hands. But it was all put to good use. To ease suffering to help the poor, and to service those who most needed it. And so the boy continues on, deepening his faith day by day. Regularly, the local villagers ask him to pray for them, taking note of the way that, even as a young child, he exhibits patterns of holy living. Days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into years, until one particular day, now an 18-year-old young man, he receives news that shatters the few remaining ties he has to the physical world. Yaku was my child. After three days, I will be leaving. What do you mean? Where are you living? After three days, I will leave. I will die. My angel came and he told me so. It's common for saints to know the exact date of their death. Notably, St. John of San Francisco, St. Mary of Egypt, and St. Porphyrios all had foreknowledge of their death date. You saw your angel? What was he like? How did you see him? Don't, don't ask me what he was like. He came and he told me, Theodora, after three days, when the sun is rising in the east, like a reed, I will come and take you. Take care to be ready. Almost immediately, my mother fell very ill, probably with pneumonia. It was a Monday. On Wednesday, after three days, as the angel had foretold, she got up with a lot of effort. She put on the one change of clothes she had. She had given away the rest as charity, and she lay down on a seat, looking towards the east. The sun arose to the height of a reed, and then she called out for me. My child, you will become a priest, and you will become what you were destined to be. But I will leave you with one burden, your sister. Protect her, raise her, and after that, you can go to fulfill your destiny. You will have my blessing. He now spends his days at the cemetery where, like an arrow from below, a thought shoots into his mind. is punishing you. The This thought spreads. He will not forgive you, the And now she is dead. Yes. God is punishing me. I will never go to church again.
Yaakovos, my child. Do you think with those tears of yours you are making my dress wet? God didn't punish you by taking me. My time came and God took me. And that thing you said about not going to church again, don't say that. Don't. Go. Go just like you used to. Though he still feels a deep pain, it's balanced out by a deep peace in his heart. Stability slowly returns, and for the following years, he cares for his siblings alongside his father before he too passes. All the while, World War II comes to an end, but the ripples reverberate throughout Greece resulting in rising tensions until 1944, when the Greek Civil War has fully erupted. By 1947, he's drafted into the Greek army. During the course of his service, he keeps the miraculous icon of Saint Haralambos with him, frequently imploring the saint to keep him from having to fire at or kill anyone. I placed it on the top of my gun and told the sand. You keep watch like a scout. Keep an eye over my area. From here to there. Unbeknownst to him, a group of guerrilla fighters are waiting in that herd of sheep. He begins to transport his mind upwards, deep in prayer. Now a few of these fighters make their way around his position, ready to strike at his backside. But then, out of the blue, one of the fighters reasons with his fellow soldier. What, the, what did he do to us? We, we should not put ourselves in danger without a serious reason. Thus, I was saved by the intercession of a saint. I didn't even know about the danger that I survived until a shepherd came by the next day and told me about it. From the station at Volos, he's transferred to Athens where his commanding officer, Blessed Polycarp Zo, clears pathways for him to visit church whenever he needs to. In this way, he's able to go through his training years in a state that glorifies God. However, the teller of lies doesn't fail to send a fair share of temptations towards the young man. One night, while following his fellow soldiers after a shift, they lead him to a certain building entrance and tell him to look inside. But immediately averts his eyes. Whispers from the devil flow into the left ear of one of the soldiers and they grab him from behind. Come on, Yakovos. Rather than give in and strengthen by divine zeal, he grabs back and resists, and eventually they let him go. Fine, lacking up, letting up. You will play the we call you Yakovos Joy. Through trials with others countered by rest in Christ's church and a 
assignments on the ground countered by prayer of the heart. He floats through his three years of required service in a way that brings glory to God. And now, at the age of 30, after fulfilling the duty to his country, he returns to his village to fulfill the duty to his family. The seasons change, and two more cycles of the year complete as he works whatever job he can find, slowly accumulating enough money to provide a dowry for his sister. Eventually, God sends a suitable husband for her, and at the start of her new path in marriage, he begins the path of monasticism. His desire is to travel from Evia to the Holy Land, to find a cave and to dwell there, worshiping God continually. But first, he figures it best to journey through the lesser traveled paths from his home village to the mountains in order to reach the monastery of St. David of Evia. This monastery was built around 500 years ago in 1520. During this time, St. David journeys across Russia collecting money needed to build the monastery. Once he gathers enough, he makes his way back to Greece and gathers some monks and hires some craftsmen to start construction. However, he soon sees that they're building the monastery at the wrong location. When he asks them why, they say there's no water where he originally wanted it put. So St. David leads them up the mountain and he gets down on his knees and he begins asking for intercession from the Most Holy Theotokos to her son. As soon as he finishes, he gets up, takes his staff, and knocks at the root of a big tree. And behold, water gushes out, flowing down to the foothills. However, for reasons known only to the Lord, the saint simply allows the craftsmen to continue the construction at the point where they had originally started, where, even to this day, the original holy river still feeds into the main courtyard. It's in this area that Yakovos looks upwards from the path he's been walking. But as his eyes gaze upon it, it seems to change. Small houses like little palaces are suspended in the air. And at the entrance, never seen this before. What beautiful little houses these are. My child, if you were going to stay here, we would have given you one. But you came here just to venerate and then leave. Without even thinking about it, the aspiring monk responds, Elder, I will stay. And as soon as he says this, The saint passes through, and everything disappears. Where before there had been a beautiful floating city, now stands overgrown cliffs, thistle-filled forests, and ruins with only a few run-down cells where older monks now dwell. Undeterred and inspired by this holy vision, Iakovos joins the Brotherhood as a novice. But one problem persists. His hair. It seems to him that a monk should have a full beard and mustache. But he can't seem to grow one. So with divine zeal, he asks for intercessions from St. David and the Theotokos that they may pray to Christ 
for him. Seven days later, a full beard and mustache have grown on his face and would remain with him until the end of his earthly sojourn. He passes the days working tirelessly to keep the cycle of services. Outside of the services, he utilizes the carpentry skills he had previously learned with his father to repair the rundown cells and chapel all throughout the summers. Eating only a small amount of food and water and fasting the rest of the time, he's strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and he never wavers despite the amount of physical labor he's doing. Brother Yakovos receives a letter from his abbot. The abbot of the monastery, Father Nicodemus, is quite elderly, and he lives a long five-hour walk from the main monastery grounds. So his letter informs Brother Yakovos that he's to give some oil to one of the workers as a gift of thanks. Brother Yakovos takes this letter to the icon of St. David, asks for intercession in doing this task, and proceeds to gift the oil. And now, Brother Yakovos sits at the entrance of the monastery. When he sees his abbot, Father Nicodemus, approaching the entrance. Father, bless. But Father Nicodemus is clearly in a rage. Why did you give away the monastery's oil? Now we will have no more oil. Elder, as a young child I was saved from the Turks and I survived so many dangers because God protected me. But if you think that I should be strangled, then do as you think. I gave the oil to the man because I received your letter to do so, and then I read it to St. David. Well, then where is the letter? Show me! Being younger and more spry, Brother Yakovos runs to his cell ahead of Father Nicodemus grabs the letter, and begins burning it before Father Nicodemus arrives. Bursting through the door, the abbot asks, What papers are burning there? Oh, nothing, my elder. Just some old scraps. Please forgive me. You were right. Father Nicodemus stares at the burnt ash, softens a little, then laughs. My elder, I either did this to test if I would argue for myself, or he actually forgot because of his blood sugar problem. God knows, but in any case, I wasn't sorry for burning the letter. These trials and temptations slowly continue testing Brother Yakovos, and as a result, his faith is deepened. But the evil one is enraged at seeing a soul grow in such humility, self-sacrifice, and likeness to Christ. So God, as to continue refining the soul of his son, allows Satan to attack Brother Yakovos more noticeably. He's working on repairing one of the monastery rooms. And by evening, he's growing tired, so he decides to lay down on one of the beds in the room he's fixing. When all of a sudden, the door bursts open. And in walks something dressed like a soldier with a worn-out uniform and a single third eye on its forehead. Following behind, 18 more demons flood into the room some with human-like faces, others with faces like apes and other beasts. Brother Yakovos tries to make the sign of the cross, but three grab his arm, pin it to the bed. They punch him across the face and body, pull out his beard and head hair in chunks at a time, dislocate his shoulder. Meanwhile, an elderly pilgrim is downstairs, fixing food. She hears the commotion above. Finally, gets his hand free, 
makes the sign of the cross, and the moment he completes it, the demons run in terror, squealing and jumping out the window. You didn't come up and help me? She turns around, terrified at his bloodied appearance. Forgive me, brother. I thought you were doing the carpentry. God frequently lets his athletes get to the point where they've reached the bitter end of their physical and spiritual endurance. And when it seems as if there is no more human hope, then he intervenes. Such trials and temptations were not permitted to the elder for no reason. Rather, they were permitted to refine his soul. In this way, trials turned into gifts that filled his heart with divine grace. Never in Brother Yakovos's life does he strive for any position of power or acclaim within the church. So it's with great surprise to him that one day, Abbot Nicodemus informs him, Get cleaned up, wash yourself, and comb your hair. We are going to Halkida. Chalkida is the chief town of Evia, Greece. And its patron saint is Saint Pereskivi, the same one who he met so many years ago. They make their way to the Metropolitan, Blessed Gregory, who informs Yakovos that he will be made a priest. Though Yakovos doesn't particularly want or feel he is worthy to serve as a priest, he accepts the position only in obedience to his elder and bishop. I was able to take daily of the pure mysteries and I felt such a power inside of me that I was like a lion. From the morning until night, I worked without feeling tired. I had such a divine fire burning in my soul. On one occasion, Father Yakovos asks Saint David and Prophet Elias to use their power granted by Christ to impart the monastery with enough oil to share with everyone. After concluding, he goes down to where the oil is stored and hears a strange rattling sound. He looks over and sees the jar of oil shaking furiously, spilling out the top. At first, I thought a mouse had gotten into the jar. He tried to get out, and in the process, he had knocked off the lid and spilled the oil. Whether it be oil, coin, or manual labor, Elder Yakovos serves his flock with absolute and resolute energy and divine zeal. Never tiring throughout his travels, rather energized by the Holy Spirit. But now, at the age of 55, he hears an omen. A demon possessing a woman makes its way to the elder and informs him that My father, Lucifer, has received permission to torment your body. And now, sitting in the hospital, he's just been diagnosed with the elder sits and prays. A few minutes later, a bearded man with a long white beard holding a cane enters through the doors. Behind him is a younger man in a black robe. How are you, Father Yaikovos? I'm bearing it. What am I to do? Who am I? I don't know who you are. I am Saint David, and here is Saint John the Confessor. We have come to help you. Elder Yakovos sees sweat on St. David's forehead, amazed at how quickly they've rushed to his aid. He turns to Father Nicodemus beside him. My elder, here are St. David and St. John the Russian. What are you saying? Don't say things like that. If anyone hears you, they'll say that Father Yakovos has lost his mind. 
Elder Yakovos turns back and still sees the saints standing there with him, while simultaneously outside of time. And it's this operation that gives him an extension for the next few years. But still, his body grows weaker. Varicose veins afflict his legs, making it extremely painful to even stand. Despite this, he continues serving divine liturgy, never complaining or bringing attention to himself. As the years continue, more bodily afflictions. Vertigo makes it so that he can barely move his head from side to side. In response, he simply greets this new affliction as another opportunity to detach from the world and grow closer to Christ. His increasing popularity as a true man of God means that from the poor to the rich, from the university professors to the uneducated, the faithful rushed to him, asking him for advice, to which, oftentimes, he would already know before they even asked. When Mary was three years old, her parents, Joachim and Anna, decided that the time had come to fulfill their promise and offer her to the Lord. Joachim gathered the young girls of the neighborhood to form a line in front of Mary while they carried torches. Captivated by the light, the Holy Virgin ran towards the temple and threw herself into the arms of the high priest Zacharias. Zacharias blessed her, saying, It is in you that he has glorified your name in every generation. It is in you that he will reveal the redemption that he has prepared for his people in the last days. This is the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God into the temple. This day signifies her total dedication to God's will, and it is a feast of anticipation. And it's on this feast day in the year 1991 that Saint Yakovos isn't serving divine liturgy. Instead, he's chanting and receiving the holy mysteries, fully aware of what is about to occur. In the afternoon, at around four, he puts on his vestment, lays down, and accompanied by a cloud of heavenly witnesses, gives up his soul and passes on from this life to the next. Dear Professor, Christ is reason and many use. The photograph I'm sending you is uh, to inform you of a miraculous event that took place with the uh, late Elder Yakaris Statis, whom you've written about. In short, a certain young deacon from Cyprus who is known to me uh, visited the monastery of the Elder in October of 1992 to meet Father Yakpos up close. But the, uh, the monks, you know, they, they, they informed him that Father Yark was reposed last year on uh, November 21st, 1991. The teaching was sad that he didn't get to meet the elder uh, while he was still alive, so instead he asked the monks to see a cell and to photograph uh, some of his belongings. And then it, uh, it happened. When the deacon returned to Cyprus, he took the film to a certain photo studio to, to have it developed, and... Uh, in one of the photographs, the one I sent you, the light elder is depicted. At the bottom left corner, you'll see the exact date, October 8th, 1992, when the photo was taken. I, I have one observation, don't mind about the photo, the, the light elder is uh, full-bodied in gigantic proportions in relation to the space in his cell and the very near distance to the wall from where the photo was taken. 
You can make a comparison with the photo on the cover of your book. Uh, a professional Cypriot photographer told me that it takes at least 15 feet to shoot a full-length upright person. With heartfelt wishes. Now I, James, wrote this history in Jerusalem when there was a commotion over Herod's death. I went into the wilderness until the commotion in Jerusalem had died down. And I was glorifying the Lord God who gave me the wisdom to write this history. And grace shall be with them that fear our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory to ages of ages.